Um, hello, everyone. My name is Roy Culpepper. I am the chair of the group of 78, and I'd like to welcome you all to this luncheon event. Uh, I have a few housekeeping announcements before introducing our very special guest. It's just over a month since our annual conference on getting to nuclear zero, building common security for a post-mad world. We're currently compiling the proceedings and recommendations of the conference and aim to release our report shortly. Um, meanwhile, in July, some 122 countries had approved the UN treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. And when the treaty was open for signature on September the 20th, some 55 countries signed the treaty and three of those have now ratified. The treaty will enter into force once 50 countries have ratified. Canada, regrettably, was not among the countries supporting the, cre the treaty, wasn't among the 122 uh, approving it, uh, and the government has expressed disdain for the treaty. Uh, to, or to put it in Prime Minister Trudeau's words, it's sort of useless. However, the committee awarding the, no the Nobel Peace Prize um, clearly didn't think it was sort of useless. Uh, on the contrary, uh, they th came to the decision that the, the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons was crucially important. So on October the 6th, it announced that the Peace Prize this year was to be awarded to the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. ICANN is an international civil society coalition that played a key role in the approval of this uh, crucial treaty. So uh, the Group of 78 has requested a meeting with the Prime Minister or the Foreign Minister to discuss car Canada's current position on nuclear disarmament. Our request has been acknowledged by the PMO and we hope to have an opportunity for a frank dialogue with the government about Canada's role on this issue, which, along with climate change, which is the subject of our conference next year, uh, is the most urgent issue facing the world today. So stay tuned. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements about upcoming events. In just over a week, the Group of 78 is hosting a panel discussion on Canada's new posture in the international arena. The aim of the panel is to take a hard look at Canada's international policies under the current government, which is now at, its, uh, at the midpoint of its uh, first term. Um, the panel features Peggy Mason, who will speak about defense policy, Julia Sanchez, who will speak on international assistance, and Angela McEwen on international trade. The panel will be moderated by former uh, Ambassador Ferry de Kirchhoff. The event will take place on November the 9th from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Bruyere Hospital Auditorium. Admission is $15 or $5 for students or unwaged individuals. Um, there should be an information poster on, on this event. Uh, Sarah, is there an information poster on our panel? Uh, on, on the registration desk for further details. So our last luncheon event of the year, I find myself uh, stunned at uh, saying this is the end of the year, uh, but anyway, our last luncheon event will take place on November the 28th in this very space. It will continue in the vein of critically examining Canada's role uh, in the world. Our speaker will be Madeleine Drohan, well-known Canadian journalist who currently writes for The Economist magazine, or the economist newspaper, as they like to call themselves. <laughs> Madeline is currently writing a, a, a book about how Canada is perceived in the rest of the world. Her talk is entitled, Is Canada Back? <laughs> Finally, a reminder to all of those who are members to please renew your membership if you have not already done so. And to those who are not yet members, uh, to please consider joining us. Uh, our membership is the bedrock of uh, the group of 78. So, um, 
On to our guest speaker. Uh, Professor Paul Robinson of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. Um, and let me preface my introduction by saying that the questionable role of NATO has emerged frequently in G78 discussions over the past couple of years. So we resolved to find a speaker to address this contentious topic. I came across Paul a couple of months ago. I think it was in June. He was uh, in a TV Ontario panel uh, along with um, Janice Stein, Stephen Seidemann, and Erica uh, Simpson. Paul was the only one who took a critical view of NATO's continued existence almost two decades after the end of the Cold War. And I should point out that Paul is not only a scholar of international security issues, he has also served in the armed forces of both the UK and Canada. So he's very knowledgeable about both the theory as well as the practice of warfare. So please welcome Professor Paul Robinson. I have to, I have to hold this thing up. Yes. Okay, that's very unfortunate, but okay, there we go. So, um, does everybody hear that? Okay. Okay, this isn't ideal, but we'll, 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 if I prop my elbow on this, maybe not, that will help me a little bit. So, thank you all for turning up. Thank you, uh, Roy, for inviting me to give this uh, a talk about uh, NATO. Um, and I'm glad to see so many of you taking time off from lunch to, to do this. So, about 70 years ago, Canada was one of the founding members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, NATO for short. And ever since, NATO has been one of the key institutions shaping Canadian foreign and defense policy. Okay, that much I'm sure you all know. Um, and today, Canadian security experts and politicians insist that NATO is fundamental to our national security. But is it? Events of the past few years make this question extremely pertinent. NATO has fought wars in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and Libya, and now claims to be deterring what it calls Russian aggression. Yet it is questionable whether any of these actions were or are either desirable or effective. The threat which NATO was created to counter has disappeared, and in its search for new reasons for existence, NATO has arguably done more harm than good. So today I want to pose the question, do we still need NATO, and I hope uh, to provoke uh, a response from you all. Okay. Uh, I, I will not be neutral uh, at the end of the day. Um. But bear in mind, you know, I, I am a, for everything I say, I, I, am a, I am a former soldier. So, so much of what I say, I say with a certain degree of reluctance based on realism, not out of sort of ideological fervor or anything like that. Um, so to answer this question, I think we, we need to go back in time and think about what NATO was created to do in the first place. And, and having done that, we can move on to the post-Cold War world and look at how the world has changed, creating new security requirements. And then we can examine NATO's actions in the new world order and determine whether these actions have been beneficial. Okay. And that is the rough outline of, of my talk. So let's start with NATO's creation all the way back in 1949. And the rationale for creating NATO was well expressed in, in the famous phrase, keep the Soviets out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Okay. So the first of these Soviets out was pretty obvious. Okay. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the Soviet Union maintained large forces in Europe, which posed a potential threat to the security of the Western world. And in 1947 and 1948, communist regimes were established throughout the zone occupied by the Soviet army. There were also strong communist forces in, in many Western countries, particularly Italy and France. So there was a, a, a well-founded uh, uh, an understandable fear of, of communist expansion, and NATO was a means of stopping it. And it wasn't designed to actually fight communism, but to deter it. Okay. So deterring a Soviet attack became the primary raison d'etre of NATO for the first 45 years of its existence. Beyond this, there was a fear among American leaders that after the Second World War, the Americans would go back home and leave it to Europeans to defend themselves. Europe was physically and financially exhausted at the end of the Second World War. The major powers, France and England, were, were fighting colonial wars 
um, and really didn't have the resources to do much to, to defend Europe. The Germans, obviously, no one was going to let them have an army at that point in time. So they wanted to keep, people wanted to keep the Americans in. Um, and that way, Europeans wouldn't have to carry out the full burden of defending themselves and someone else could, could, could foot the bill. Uh, and finally, the, there was the third purpose of keeping the Germans down. This was less important, but, but nonetheless real. NATO was a mechanism by which Germany, or West Germany as it then was, could be allowed to rearm, but in a safe way. So none of these rationales for NATO's existence still exist. The, NATO, the Soviet threat has disappeared, and the alleged Russian threat pales into insignificance by comparison. There's no equivalent ideological or military danger requiring an alliance of the size and shape of NATO. Nor does Europe actually need the Americans anymore. European states have, have long since recovered from the Second World War. They're, they're extremely rich and, and perfectly capable of defending themselves. If you compare the Russian defense budget to the European defense budgets of the European members of NATO, so get rid of the United States, just consider the European members of NATO the European members of NATO spend four times as much on defense as the Russians. Not only that, but the Europeans have two million troops, the Russians have 800,000, and they're spread out all the way from Kaliningrad to Sakhalin, like 10,000 miles away, right? So if you actually look at what's in Europe, okay, the Europeans vastly outnumber and outspend the Russians. They're, they're quite capable of managing affairs for themselves without the Americans. Um, as for keeping the Germans down, um, it's not desperately relevant uh, anymore, at least in military sense. I don't think anyone actually thinks that the Germans are going to invade Poland again. Or anything like that. So why does it carry on? Well, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO realized that its future was in jeopardy, so it set about reinventing itself, and it claimed two tasks. The first task, uh, these were both new tasks. The first task was called defense diplomacy, <coughs> And the idea here was that NATO would help spread democracy and liberalism to the countries, uh, former communist countries of Eastern Europe. And through a partnership of peace scheme and then through NATO expansion, the idea was that NATO would teach former communist states how to reform their institutions in such a way as to ensure a prosperous, liberal, democratic future. The second task was what became known as out-of-area operations. So until the 1990s, NATO had operated exclusively within Europe and the North Atlantic. However, it was obvious that if it stayed like that, it wouldn't have anything to do anymore. <laughs> so therefore, um, it had to go elsewhere in order to stay alive. So in 1993, American Senator Luger coined the phrase, out of area or out of business. Uh, and this was, this was picked up by the British politician George Robertson, who was Secretary General of NATO from 1994 to 2004. And out of area or out of business became such something of a Robertson catchphrase. And it's actually uh, quite interesting because when he was saying this, Robertson wasn't saying, we've got to go out of area because our security requires that we go out of area. He wasn't even saying, we've got to go out of area because the security of the world requires us to go out of area. He's saying, we've got to go out of area for our own institutional interests. Okay, it's very revealing. So, so you can see here how bureaucratic institutional interests prevailed over genuine national or even international interests. Okay, keeping the institution alive um, became uh, the aim, regardless of why the institution was there. Now, we might perhaps forgive NATO all that if these new missions had turned out well. Um, but defense diplomacy has had, at best, a mixed outcome. So NATO's defenders will say, well, look, you know, we Eastern European countries have, for the most part, been well integrated within the European Union. They've become stable democracies. And therefore, you know, this has worked. Um, but it's very hard to prove how much of that has got, actually got to do with NATO. Um, there have been many other things going on. For instance, you might argue that actually the European Union has played a far more important role in, in, in the transition process. And also, it could just be that those countries wanted to move that direction anyway. And we're going to move in that direction anyway. So actually proving that NATO had anything to do with this is, is, is a little hard, particularly as NATO was a military institution. So what it was helping reform were not democratic institutions particularly, it was reforming military institutions. Um, but it's, you know, how important to military institutions in say Romania or Bulgaria or something like that? And the answer is, is not, not very. And um, they'll say, yeah, but, you know, those institutions now are under democratic control and there's not gonna be a military coup. Yeah, but there's not gonna be a military coup in Belarus either, right? So 
the extent to which it's really, um, I don't want to rule this out entirely as having done some benefits, but it's very hard to pin, pin it down uh, very much. Um, meanwhile, the, the process of defense diplomacy has had some negative uh, repercussions, particularly NATO expansion. There's no doubt that NATO sees the expansion, sorry, Russia sees the expansion of NATO as threatening. Now, whether they are right to do so it is, is something we, we can argue about, but the fact is they do. Um, moreover, the policy of defense diplomacy helped to provoke the 2008 war in Georgia and the 2014 war in Ukraine. The encouragement which Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili thought he had received from Western states, I don't think he really had, but he, he thought he'd received it from Western states, encouraged him to uh, attack South Ossetia in August 2008, thereby starting a war of Russia. Similarly, uh, the perception that NATO wishes to expand into Ukraine has played a role in determining Russia's response to the overthrow of President Yanukovych of Ukraine in February 2014. So on the whole, it would see that NATO's actions have exacerbated tensions in Eastern Europe rather than alleviated them. As for out of area operations, these have not gone well at all. NATO advocates uh, NATO advocates would maintain that its bombing campaign against Yugoslavia in 1999 prevented ethnic cleansing and other gross abuses of human rights. Now, I'll be fair and say that a, a reasonable argument can be put forward that this is, this is the case. Um, but an equally reasonable argument can be put forward that NATO didn't do anything of the sort. Um, the great majority of those killed in Kosovo, as well as those who actually fled Kosovo, were killed or fled after NATO started its bombing, uh, not before it. Um, and NATO killed some 1,500 Yugoslavs during its campaign, but it's reckoned that only 2,000 people had been killed in Kosovo prior to the campaign, of which half are actually Serbs killed by the Kosovo Liberation Army. So the Serb forces had killed about 1,000 Kosovars. Before NATO intervened, NATO then killed 1,500 Yugoslavs, so NATO actually killed more Yugoslavs than the Yugoslavs killed Kosovars. Okay. Uh, this is the kind of facts NATO doesn't really like t to admit to. Okay. Furthermore, the now independent Kosovo is not a great success story. I mean, you could say at least there's not a war going on there. So, so in, in that sense, you know, I'm not going to say you can't put a positive spin on this, but I think it, it's, not, it's not as clear cut as it, it's made out to be. We should also bear in mind that the Kosovo campaign severely aggravated NATO's relations with Russia and almost led to something much worse. So you may, may recall, those of you who are old enough, that after the Yugoslavs surrendered, the Russians sent uh, troops to Pristina Airport in Kosovo. Uh, and um, General Wesley Clark, who was the NATO commander, it is said, ordered the ground commander of the NATO forces, uh, a Brit called General Michael Jackson, to attack the Russians in Pristina Airport. So um, Jackson apparently refused, saying, I'm not going to start World War III. Now, I didn't know if this was true or not until a couple of years ago when I gave a talk at the U.S. Naval War College. And afterwards, I was at dinner sitting next to some retired admiral who revealed that he'd been Wesley Clark's... Uh, Chief of Staff at the time. So I said to him, is it, is it true that Wesley Clark ordered Michael Jackson to attack the Russians? And he said, yeah, I wrote the order. <laughs> okay, so um, when considering Kosovo, it's worth remembering how close NATO took us to something really bad. Okay. Um, as for next, NATO's next out-of-area operation, Afghanistan, it's hard to see how anybody could call this a success. Okay. After years of fight, fighting, NATO has utterly failed to restore order in Afghanistan. Indeed, the country is now more unstable and Taliban more powerful than when NATO arrived. Okay. The latest um, report um, by a guy called the Special Inspector General of Afghan Reconstruction came in my email today. It says that the Taliban now own more provinces and uh, more, more territory in Afghanistan than ever before, but the scale of fighting is higher than ever before. Okay. Take an example, for instance, Helmand province. Until 2006, when NATO troops arrived, um, it, was only, it was an American show, not a NATO show. Okay? In 2006, it became a NATO show, and therefore the British troops moved into Helmand province as part of the NATO forces. Now, until that moment, from the accounts I've read from aid workers, Helmand was quite peaceful. Aid workers drove freely around the province. The moment NATO British troops arrived, all hell broke loose. And there have been a number of memoirs published by British participants who admit that they completely screwed it up. Okay. It's not that NATO, in the form of the British, failed to defeat the Taliban and failed to stabilize the province. Their actions actually helped the Taliban and destabilized the province. They made matters worse, not better. 
This just wasn't the case with the Brits. Uh, in Kandahar province, when the Canadians operated, uh, for instance, the result of NATO's presence was the return of the thugs whom the Taliban had driven out several years previously, and whom the locals in many cases disliked more than they disliked the Taliban. So you may remember General Hillier saying we were fighting scumbags. What he didn't mention was that we were fighting scumbags on behalf of even worse scumbags. Okay. Um, and where do you think the Taliban get their money and their weapons? Okay. So while NATO was in Afghanistan, they got a lot of their money by extorting it from the contractors whom NATO was paying. So in other words, they got their money from NATO. So this uh, guy I just mentioned, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, John Sopko, uh, he's the man the, the Americans pay to audit the money they've spent there. Um, and he noted recently that Taliban had stopped supplying weapons to its troops and told its commanders to buy them off the Afghan army instead because it was cheaper. And to quote Sopko, the end of the American supply chain in Afghanistan is the Taliban. And think of how much all this has cost. The Americans have spent over a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. Think about a trillion dollars. Okay. Other NATO countries haven't spent as much, but it's still quite a lot. One analysis of the British campaign uh, on behalf of NATO in Afghanistan assesses it, but it costs 40 billion pounds. That's about 70 billion Canadian dollars. Canada is said to have spent over 10 billion dollars in Afghanistan. Overall, the non-American NATO countries must have spent between 100 and 200 billion dollars in Afghanistan. So that's a total of about 1.2 trillion, maybe. And yet, the latest report shows that the Taliban control more of Afghanistan than ever before. Okay. Do you think that's good value for money? Okay. And think of what that enormous amount of money could have been spent on. What good it could have done if it had been spent on something else. Now our Canadian government has announced huge increases in defense spending in order to satisfy its NATO requirements. Now what benefits will we accrue from that? You know, frankly, I, you know, we might as well flush our money down the toilet. Be quite crude. And then there's late NATO's last military campaign, the air water overthrow Gaddafi in Libya. Our own government was extremely proud of that. We even had a, a, a fly past. Uh, what was the result? Libya's turned into an ungovernable mess. Weapons from Libya have flowed south into the hands of Al-Qaeda in Mali, making the situation there much worse. And if reports are to be believed, weapons have also flowed out of Libya into the hands of the Al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front in Syria, with the Americans' blessing, apparently. Um, so, so how exactly has that made us any safer? Europe has suffered actually quite considerably as a result of NATO's Libyan war. The collapse of the Gaddafi regime has meant that the Libyan government has lost control of its coastline, and Libya has therefore become the conduit through which hundreds of thousands of Africans have sailed across the Mediterranean into Europe. So the refugee crisis is a direct consequence of the Libyan war. Okay. So how has that benefited NATO members? Okay. Not at all. We can see therefore that NATO is not helping to stabilize the world through its out of area operations. Now I, I don't, I say that with regret. It'd be nice if, if we could say that it was. I'm not sort of, making some ideological point against NATO here. It's just that if you look at the facts, it's not actually helping anything. And it's costing a vast amount of sums of money in, in the process. Now, perhaps a vague inkling that this might be the case has caused NATO to turn back to its original mission, defending Europe. Unfortunately, a nice enemy has popped up, because now we can defend Europe not against the Soviet Union, but against Russia. Because, you know, the Russians are coming. You know, the, Rus the Russians are everywhere, you know. Your, your student hands in his homework like this because Putin ate it. You know, it's like, it's like Putin, Putin, Putin. Everything, you know, you, you, your car hits a, hits a pothole in Ottawa, you know, it's Putin's fault. That's the, like the degree to which the recurrent insanity ha has reached. Um, and deterring the Russian threat has now become the new justification for NATO's existence. But the Russians aren't coming. As I said, you know, they're, they're vastly outspent and outgunned. They couldn't come even if they wanted to. And they have no reason to come. Um, they lack both the power and the will. Uh, and unfortunately, though, it suits NATO to have enemies. So it therefore suits NATO to create them. And again, this doesn't help us here in Canada. And it certainly doesn't help make the world a safer place. Con quite the contrary. Okay? It almost seems as if NATO's primary person 
purpose sometimes is to annoy the Russians. Take, for instance, NATO's missile defense plans. So NATO's spending a lot of money to build missile defense system in Europe, and, and the uh, alleged purpose of this missile defense system is to defend Europe against nuclear-tipped Iranian ballistic missiles. Nobody in Russia believes that that is true. Putin was once told this, and he, he, he burst out laughing uh, in front of the, the interviewer. Um, because there are no nuclear-tipped Iranian ballistic missiles. And besides, they're building this uh, air defense syst this system in Poland, which isn't a lot of use for you know, defending, say, Greece against a, uh, uh, an Iranian nuclear missile. And part of a system is American anti-ballistic missile cruisers sailing around the Baltic Sea close to Kaliningrad. Like, what has that got to do? So, so the Russians just look at it, and they don't believe it. That doesn't mean that we don't believe it. I mean, because, you know, there's all sorts of financial interests, and, you know, so, so we may actually believe our own propaganda, but the Russians don't believe it, not for a second. So it just annoys them, okay? Uh, and as a result of our ballistic missile defense system, they moved more ballistic missiles the Russians have into Kaliningrad. Okay. So how has that made Europe safer? Okay. It hasn't. It's made it less safe. So when we look at NATO's attempt to reinvent itself in terms of defense diplomacy and out-of-area operations, we can see that both of these tasks were the product of a particular sentiment which arose as a result of the West victory over communism and the unusual opportunities which seemed to open up in the 1990s in the era of American hegemony. So both out-of-area operations and defense diplomacy were a product of this particular environment of the 1990s when there was no counterbalance to NATO and it there was a sort of belief that history with a big H had proved that the West was right. That the end of history was just around the corner and there was nothing that we could not do if we just put our mind to it. And there was nobody left to stop us. We had the power. All we had to do was use it. You know, as Madeleine Albright said, what's the point of this army you're always talking about if we don't use it? Okay. It was just a sentiment of arrogance, essentially. Okay. It was also a result of a set of very peculiar international circumstances at a time when for a short period NATO accounted for about three quarters of world defense spending okay, and really did seem unstoppable. And this sentiment caused, caused us to overreach and we have suffered for it. But the circumstances which justified this sentiment no longer exist. Amer American power is waning and so too is European power. Economics is the key. Bit by bit, the center of the world economy is shifting to Asia. China is already the largest economy in the world. In a few years' time, India will be second. Yet, for some reason, we remain stuck in a set of Atlantic institutions which do not in the slightest reflect this changing balance of power. Canada has sent troops to Latvia, as if the tiny country of Latvia is in some way a vital Canadian interest. Okay. It's a move which reflects a thoroughly outmoded mo view of thinking which puts Europe at the center of the world. It isn't anymore. As a country which straddles both the Atlantic and the Pacific, Canada needs to start thinking more in terms of the Pacific, and defending Latvia is meaningless in terms of Canadian security. Atlanticism's days are numbered. I mean, it'll be quite a, few, quite a large number. <laughs> it's, it's not going to disappear overnight, but, but, but it, it, they're numbered. By clinging onto it, we run the risk of missing the opportunities which lie elsewhere. Now, when I say this, I, I'm often um, then countered by sort of arguments which go along the lines of this. Well, they say, well, you know, that's all true. I'll grant you all that, okay? But that, that's not the point, okay? You see, if you talk about whether we need NATO, and you, you don't mean Europe or, or America, but Canada specifically, it's never been about defending Europe, and it's never been about making the world a safer place. So the fact it doesn't do those things is, is irrelevant. That's not the point. Okay? The point is cozying up to the Americans. Okay? Uh, we need NATO because we need some sort of forum where we can be at the same table as the Americans and exert some influence over them. So even if whatever thing you, sa you say is true, we still need NATO because we need to be at that table. Right? And that's actually what it's all about. So, so, so what if it destabilizes Libya? You know, we get a, we, we, we get a seat at the table, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing. This isn't a, 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 a totally worthless argument, but I don't think it's as good as its proponents make out. After all, why does it have to be that particular table? When, I mean, there are, there are many tables y you can be at, and we are at, okay? 
the Japanese aren't in NATO, it doesn't mean the Americans don't speak to the Japanese. Okay, because the Japanese are rich. You obviously got to listen to the Japanese, right? Um, and to what extent is it true that participating in NATO influences the Americans in any meaningful way? So it was often said that we had to be in Afghanistan because that way we got influence over the Americans. But what influence? And this is the question I'll ask. You know, like, w what policies did the Americans change which favored Canada as a result of us being in Afghanistan? Did they suddenly uh, change their policy on softwood lumber? <laughs> did they suddenly approve the Keystone Pipeline? So, so what exactly is this influence, right? You know, tell, give me some examples. And, and I'll, I'll ask this, and these guys go, um, well, you know, it's not, y y it's, it's a more, more amorphous, so you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, it's pretty useless as a, cla as, as a, as a claim. Um, so, you know, maybe there's something to it, okay? But it's extremely amorphous, and it comes at a very high cost. So I, I don't actually think that this is a very good argument, particularly as there are other ways of exerting influence. So all in all, I, um, I come to the conclusion that the case in favor of NATO is a very weak one. The missions for which it was created no longer exist. The missions it has given itself since the end of the Cold War have not turned out well, and it's hard to see what influence it actually gives us. I see no plausible evidence that it's making Canada or NATO members or the world as a whole a safer place, and possibly it's doing the opposite. In its attempt to keep itself alive, it has distorted the way its members view the world and encouraged them to behave in ways that are contrary to their own interests. The institutional interests of NATO have become more important than the interests of its members. Lord Palmerston once said, we have no permanent allies, only permanent interests. We have forgotten that. Okay. Our allies and our institutions have become ends in themselves. Okay. And that's not a good thing. Okay. Were NATO to disappear today, would anybody invade Canada? Okay. Would terrorism or other forms of international instability suddenly go out of control? Would disorder reign across the world? No. There's no reason to believe that they would. So what is NATO giving us? You know, I, I, I don't know. And I'm not naturally anti-NATO. In my youth, I, I was a, an army officer. I was decidedly pro-NATO. I, I was part of NATO forces in what was then West Germany. You know, and I, I went to West Berlin, through Checkpoint Charlie, into the east. And, you know, I, I thought we needed to defend against uh, the Soviet threat. Um, but it's not there anymore. I'm also, like, quite conservative. You know, I, I don't think you should change institutions just because some abstract theory tells you you should. So, you know, I, I instinctively I would keep an institution like NATO, but at the same time, you have to reckon, you have to change when the world changes, and, and the world has changed, okay? NATO was created for a particular set of circumstances which simply no longer exist, okay? And I'll finish off by quoting the recent speech on the principles of Canadian foreign policy by uh, Christia Freeland. And the speech came just one day before the announcement of major increases in Canadian defense spending. So her speech was, in essence, a way of justifying these defense in expenditure increases. So what did Minister Freeland say were the threats which required us to spend, I was it, 40% more on defense or something? Some vast amount of, of money. Okay, I'll quote her here. This is what she said. First, though no foreign adversary is poised to invade us, we do face clear challenges. Climate change is by definition a shared menace. Okay. Affecting every single person on the planet. Civil war, poverty, drought, and natural disasters anywhere in the world threaten us as well. End quote. So what do we have here? Climate change, civil war in other countries, poverty, drought, and natural disasters. And that's used to justify defense spending. What is climate change? Well, what does climate change or drought or natural disaster or poverty got to do with defense? How does military expenditure help us solve any of those problems? And more to the point of this particular speech, you know, how does NATO help us solve climate change, poverty, drought, and natural disasters? NATO was created to deter a major world power armed to the teeth with the most modern weapons. That's basically what it remains structured to do. It is a military alliance designed to deal with military problems using military tools. Okay. But the problems of the modern world aren't military, and the solutions to them aren't military either. 
Okay. Canada's problems aren't military. Okay. This is a far from a perfect world, but the problems we face are the ones for which military solution is not suitable. They're therefore not ones for which NATO is suitable either. You know, and, and I say that as a former army officer married to a former military officer, thereby putting his himself and his family out of a job, but you know, that is the reality, reality of it. Okay, so do we need NATO? No, we don't. We, Canada, don't. We, the West, don't. We, the world, don't. Okay. The time has come to start thinking of different ways of providing for our security in the future, ways which better suit the actual difficulties which we face. And on that note, I conclude my speech and look forward to your questions or... <laughs> Thank you for that very trenchant exposition. There's going to be a host of questions, but uh, before we go to the floor, two things. Uh, this uh, presentation has been videotaped, so we'll be uploading, we we'll be uploading the tape uh, to our website. And can, can we also get the text you of your phone? Do you want to add it? Yeah, no problem. All right, so um, let's start over here and sweep around the room that way. Let's start with Shane. I spent, uh, Shane Roberts. I spent um, two decades as a strategic analyst in foreign intelligence, including in uh, PCO's Intelligence Assessment Secretariat. Um, and um, the third decade is a futurist for national security and emergency management, trying to watch trends and try not predict what would happen, but what could happen. So a long view, the past and the present. You made some very strong statements, and in many cases you were allowed that these were not absolutes. But I'd say in terms of your bottom lines, I fundamentally and vehemently disagree with, and for sake of debate, would even posit some red letter words, naive, short-sighted, ahistorical. If the using Parallels in history is tricky, because the present is never exactly as the past. But looking at the excuses that Hitler used for aggression on neighboring European countries in terms of protecting German minorities, there are several countries in Europe where this Putin could be and has already hinted at using the same excuse and has shown a willingness to resolve questions of international law and rights by the use of blunt force like the country my family left in 68, the United States. So I see still a neo-imperialist power, but not alone. Second, in terms of recent conflicts, I was fortunate not to see the blood or hear the cries of the wounded during the Yugoslavian conflict, but I was tormented day by day with what I read as an intelligence analyst about the gross war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity and somebody needed to go in and go after some of the bastards who were there. Like ideally somebody would have gone after Assad. NATO was needed far before it went in to stop the slaughter of innocents, even if it did it incompetently. So we're talking about needs for new international instruments. And towards those new international instruments, NATO has seemed to have fumbled the ball stepping outside, but Boutrous Boutrous Galley in trying to imagine what a new international order would look like in giving some muscle to international law was one to posit NATO's potential role. Libya did not create the immigration crisis. Africa, if you exclude the colloquialism, is a fucking mess from climatic change, um, corruption, po and poverty, and a variety of other things partly the legacy of European imperialism there, because they haven't had time to develop their institutions. But NATO did not create the immigration crisis. It's a continental one which has not been dealt with in the national community. And going back to Europe, NATO is one way to keep the entire continent with all the countries from rearming. It's a move towards collective security rather than falling back to the nonsense that Trump is touting that national sovereignty is the foundation of the international oh, order. Well, thank you for disagreeing. It was very boring. I don't, if think, I'm naive at all, um, I I don't think I'm naive at all. I, I think that um, 
I, I, I would describe myself as a realist. Sort of big um, what I think is naive okay. is sort of um, what I think is naive is the sort of liberal interventionism which you describe saying we must get rid of Assad as if somehow toppling dictators we make things better okay we should have learned from hard experience but 90% of the time it, it does makes not you imagine things it makes things worse you imagine things are bad but you can always find something worse it's like one Russian philosopher I studied he, he, he was a Russian emigre after the revolution he said we used to think we weren't free under the czar then we discovered just how free we really were. Okay. Um, you know, um, uh, and the idea that somehow we topple Assad and, you know, Syria will become a liberal, democratic, free and prosperous and happy society, this is ridiculous. Okay, that's naive. Okay. Um, the idea that we can solve the problems of the world by force, okay, is naive. Okay. Because the problems of the world are not military ones, primarily. Okay. As for Russia, Russia is not going to be invading Europe. It's not going to be invading Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania or anywhere else. Okay. Uh, Russia is actually the, the country I, I study closest. I speak Russian. I go there regularly. I've written many books about Russia. Okay. What happened in Ukraine was a result of very peculiar circumstances resulting from a violent overthrow of an elected government okay, by a uh, one part of society which instituted a certain degree of rule which was thoroughly disliked and regarded as illegitimate by another part of society, okay? Um, what we have seen in Ukraine um, is not just, Russians are, are deeply involved in that, entirely true, okay? But we have also seen Ukrainian army indiscriminately shelling its own cities with heavy artillery and multiple launch rocket systems, okay? Killing hundreds of its own citizens, okay? So describe this all as somehow revanchist Russia who is threatening Europe and if we don't have NATO, the Russians will be coming is ridiculous in my point of view. It is an entirely lopsided and one-sided and misrepresentation of what is actually going on in the world, okay? And then you go on and, and you say, well, you know, Boutros Ghali had vi this idea of, of, you know, some different force. Well, that's not NATO, okay? So many people like the Russian would say, yeah, we, we need some new international structure, some structure which stretches, as they'd say, from Lisbon to Vladivostok, which includes everybody, okay? And maybe we do. I, I'm, I'm not certain what we do need, okay? Uh, and, you know, if you get rid of NATO, that doesn't mean you have nothing, but you have a void, okay? Maybe you create new institutions, okay? But those institutions aren't NATO. And you're kind of hinting at that when you're talking about something else, okay? It, it, it's NATO, what is the problem is that you have an institution which lost its reason for existence and has therefore gone about creating reasons for its existence, okay? Because it want, bureaucratically it wants to continue. So it has created problems in order to exist. And sure, Libya, you know, like problems from African refugees existed anyway, but they weren't actually able to get to Europe because the Libyans control, had firm control of their coastline. And actually, Africa is not a fucking mess. Actually, Africa, historically, by historical standards, is doing reasonably well compared with the past. You know, there's been substantial economic growth in Africa in recent uh, recent years. So, so you know, things are not all going downhill. And if you look at statistics of international violence, the amount of war in the world, the amount of violence in the world, you'll see a dramatic decline since 1990. Okay, it, the total amount of violence in the world. Uh, deaths due to war, destruction due to war is about 50% what it was 25 years ago. Uh, so the world is actually, it's not naive to think that the world I is a relatively secure place at this time and not needing these institutions, because actually the world is a relatively secure place by historical standards. And there are some long-term reasons okay, associated with that, which means that this is not necessarily just a, a little blip. Okay? Well, actually, a decline of 50% is more than a little blip. It's, 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 it's something quite dramatic. No shortage. We're going to be here till midnight. I think. <laughs> I'll make a. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll make a, a, a short observation and a, sh and a short question. Um, sorry, Akash Maharaj. I'm, I guess I, I work for the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. Um, uh, my short comment on, um, on whether or not Russia poses a threat to, um, to other countries uh, around it. I would say that your, your statement that Russia 
does not, Russia isn't going to invade any European countries, does rub up uncomfortably on the reality that it just did invade a European country by invading Crimea. And while it is possible to make all sorts of arguments about why this is a special case, why the Ukrainians have behaved um, improperly, the fact is it did cross the border and invade a European, a, another European country. And if it can find the reasons to do so in one instance, there's no reason to believe that it will not find a pretext to do so in, in another. But my, my actual question to you, though, is much like I, w I would agree that one of the mistakes that NATO made in Libya was thinking that by getting rid of one person, everything would be fine, without thinking through what happens next. My question to you is precisely that for NATO. If NATO were to be dissolved, what should take its place? Because ultimately, the idea of collective responsibility and collective security does pose a real deterrence against anyone who would in invade a small country like Latvia, although it might not affect Canada's immediate interest if someone were to invade Latvia. I think the world is a much more secure place for the knowledge that no one is going to invade La Latvia for fear of bringing down a response from those other countries. So that, that's my basic question. If, if NATO has run its course, what kind of institution would take its place in order to provide some form of effective collective deterrence? Um, okay, and, and with regard to the first point, it's not, it's not really my job here to sit around defending the Russians. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Russians would just say, you know, it's like after the annexation of Crimea, uh, John Kerry, then Secretary of State, went on TV and said, the Russians must understand that in the 21st century, you can't invade other countries on made-up pretexts. I mean, you could just hear the laughter echoing around Moscow. So, so when we're talking about countries invading other countries, okay, the Russians are pretty minor offenders uh, on this scale compared with our British and American friends and ourselves bombing Libya, right? I mean, we're no better. Let, let's be quite honest about this. So the idea that somehow we need NATO to defend the rule-based international order, it's, it's a nonsense because we're the primary breakers of the rule-based international order. Okay, so if that's what we're interested in, we need, we need to look at ourselves first. It's like the biblical quotation about why are you bothered with the, the, the splinter in someone else's eye when you've got a bloody great big moat in your own eye, right? So, so that, that's on the first point. Um, I think we should start dealing with these issues at home first. As to what comes next, I actually haven't given a lot of thought. Um, but, but I think that essentially European... Security is a matter for Europeans, and this should be a collective European issue going across all European countries. I don't think it needs Canada and the United States in it to defend, to defend Europe. I think this is a matter for the countries in Europe, the European Union, for Russia, for Belarus, and all the other European nations to work it out for themselves what best suits them. And it's not for us as Canadians to be telling them what sort of institutions they should have. So I don't actually regard it as, 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 as our issue. Okay, I, but I don't think it's something we as can Canada, you know, if we talk about this talk, do, does Canada need NATO? Well, Canada doesn't, okay, because Canada doesn't need to defend Europe, okay, and that the defense of Europe is, is for the Europeans, it's for them to work out what it should be. Hello? Yeah. I recently circulated a link to an interesting paper called NATO if necessary, but not necessarily NATO, <laughs> to a Pugwash, Canadian Pugwash discussion group. This led to the most incredible discussion that I've seen yet on any discussion group between those who believe in NATO and those who don't believe in NATO. And it uh, caused, I am not an expert in all of these things like Erica Simpson and so on and yourself, but I really wondered if there are one, one reason that Canada may wish to stay in NATO for, this, for the time being, for the t as long as Trump is still in power. Want <laughs> uh, uh, no, but if to uh, keep a coalition of people within NATO to block Trump from doing something absolutely crazy with it, and then, or trying to do something crazy, and then actually letting Trump leave, and that would lead to the dissolution of NATO. Rather, 
abstract, <laughs> but I just wondered if, yeah. I yeah, believe I in communication, you see, and I think it's really important, but as you say, it really hasn't in influenced it. And I just wondered if you'd seen that paper. I think I have, I certainly, I, I, I believe I have, but, um, and, and I see what you're getting at, and it comes to this influence issue, but um, it didn't stop uh, George W. Bush and Tony Blair invading Iraq, okay, the fact that many NATO members thought that invading Iraq was a thoroughly... Yeah, we didn't go, but we didn't stop it. Okay, they were, they were going to... Once they'd made their minds up, they were going to do it. They were going to do it, whatever the hell everybody else said. Okay, and it didn't matter what fellow NATO members thought. In the end, we had zip influence. Okay, once the Americans and the Brits have decided they're going to do something, they just do it. Okay? Um, and I think we shouldn't be naive about what influence we as Canada actually have over our southern neighbors. Because in the end, or what influence we have over the Russians or something, right? You know, they, they, don't, they don't really consider us, you know? We're, hard, we're not really on, on the radar. I, I, you know, we might like to think we are, but I don't believe we are. Um, John Kingston Foster. <laughs> there are two John Fosters in the room. I live in Kingston. <laughs> And uh, uh, I'm a pr by background a petroleum economist, and I've worked for the World Bank and oil companies. Uh, my concern about NATO, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on, on what you have said. But I, I see uh, NATO as a control mechanism for, for, for Washington. And uh, it's, the, it's the word Washington I want to raise here, having lived there 23 years. And... Uh, a control mechanism that then echoes in uh, NATO headquarters in, in Brussels, where the European Commission happens to be located as well on joint committees. And so, for, for me, uh, NATO then becomes a control mechanism for Europe. And what I see is all, all governments singing from the same hymn sheet as a result. Uh, their newspapers, who are very depleted of, of, of uh, for, foreign correspondence of any worth, uh, doing the same. So that means that the message uh, coming out of Washington is, uh, is, is, that, is, is that way. I, I'm, not, I'm, very, uh, I'm not sanguine at all that Trump can be controlled through NATO. I'm concerned it's the other way around with, with other countries uh, weakly giving in. And so uh, I, perception management bothers me. Your, your view, which I, I, I hold too, how does it get out? Where is the independent thinking? and uh, how, how to influence the dialogue. Yeah, um, on the first point, I, I, I agree with you about the way control is working. So like, it's very clear that the Canadian government's massive increases in defense spending, it's kind of strange, actually, Christian Freeland's speech, she said, we, we need to spend more so that be independent of Americans by doing what Trump is demanding, which is spending a hell of a lot more on defense. It's like, I mean, it was a massive cave into the Americans portrayed as making us independent from Americans. Okay, so because of our membership of NATO, we're following Trump. Okay, so I think you're absolutely right on that. As a how these points, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I, as I get older, I'm more and more cynical about uh, freedom of the press and stuff. I don't want to be in a conspiracy theorist because I'm not. I, if there's a choice between a cock-up theory and a conspiracy theory, I always go for the cock-up theory. Um, um, I, I have great problems with my Russian friends who believe that, you know, who are determined to believe that all the chaos we've created is deliberate, because no one would create chaos many times over S out of stupidity. It's got to be deliberate. You know? And I say, no, we're just stupid. And, and no, 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 no one's that stupid. <laughs> yes, we are. No, you're not. There's no way you're that stupid. You know? But um, when it comes to the media and, and, and the freedom of expression, or, or it's, it's not that there's no freedom of expression. It's just that there's groupthink, and, and there's consolidated interest, which means that certain points of view just do not get very much expression. Okay. So who does our parliament listen to on Ukraine? It listens to Paul Grodd of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, who is, uh, frankly, you know, not who I would listen to. And it's not even who many Ukrainian Canadians would want you to listen to. Okay. Um, but that's who they listen to, Mr. Grodd. They even took him over to my dad and so on, okay? Be be because certain groups have got a sort of lock on power and there's a group think and there's a way of thinking and no one wants to turn up at a NATO meeting and be the odd man out and the guy who's saying something which rocks the boat. And it, it, a, a, and it just creates a dynamic which makes it, frankly, 
All I can do is come along and speak at things like this and hope that somehow there's a drib and a drab here and there, but uh, I'm not convinced it's, I, I have to say, I, you know, we're pissing in the wind. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, we're up against forces far stronger than ourselves on this one, and I don't, it's like uh, Putin said something interesting the other day recently. He said, you know, like, um, he said, I've seen three American presidents. They all think that they're going to change everything. And then some guy turns up in a suit, just like mine, except his tie is blue, mine's red. And he has a briefcase, and he says, Mr. President, this is how we are. This is how things are. And then everything goes back to the way it was, okay? Because that's, what, that's how, in reality, in our democratic systems, they're not as democratic as we like, you know. I don't want to say deep state. I heard someone say deep state. Uh, that's a bit too conspiratorial for me. But, but there's, you know, there is a dynamic which creates continuity in what political scientists would call a hard policy line, which is so locked in that you just can't really change it. So we can try, but I'm not optimistic. But I don't actually know how we break through the wall. Because I, I, I originally thought, well, Iraq's such a disaster. They'll wake up. <laughs> But no, it's the same people giving foreign policy advice in the United States now as before. It's still, if you look at American newspapers, it's the same guys. It's David Brooks, it's, it's Nick, it's Mr. Crystal, it, it, it's, it's the Kaplans, you know. Still, yeah, they've been wrong on everything, okay, consistently. Yet they're still the guy who gets to write all of the op-eds, okay. It, I don't, I can't explain it, but that's, you know, it doesn't seem to be any screw-up big enough to break through. So I don't actually know, have an answer to a question because I don't actually know how to do it. I've got a simple question that I hope you can answer. Actually, two related questions. W the first one is, uh, where did the figure, the 2.2% uh, of GDP figure come from? Uh, and w why don't the majority, the vast majority of NATO members who don't achieve that figure and probably have no intention of doing so, simply g vote to get rid of it? Okay, 2% is a purely arbitrary number plucked out of thin air. Okay, but there's no particular logic or reason to have to. It's just a number bigger than we're spending at the moment. <laughs> okay, and it's a nice round number, so we can set it as a sort of target. Okay, but uh, percentage of GDP has no logic as a defense planning mechanism. So there's one guy, uh, Robert Higgs, described, he said, GDP is a measure of everything you produce from nuclear bombs to hamburgers. Okay, if you, pr if you sell more hamburgers next year, your GDP goes up. If you've linked defense spending to GDP, you'll have to spend more on defense. But why should you spend more on defense? Because you sold more hamburgers. It, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's a meaningless, from the point of view, defense planning, it's not rational, okay? But it's something, it's just like, it's a statement of intent, which is somehow meant to push people to spend more. But no one really takes it desperately seriously. You'll sign up to it, and then you don't really intend to, but you don't want to be the guy in the room who says, no, I don't want, we're not going to do that. So you just sign up. That's what I say. It's, 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 it's easier just to pretend than it is to actually knock it down, okay? Because if you knock it down, every, everyone's going to dislike you for, like, showing that the emperor has new clothes. Yeah, is it better to, you know, that's what. Because the Americans want you to do it, and you don't want to deny the Americans, and it's, 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 just, it's just easier just to say, yeah, go, go, go ahead. There we go, <laughs> because I think that would be maybe a, a bit of a stretch too far. Uh, I take a lot of your points uh, about the failings of NATO. I wouldn't dispute that. Uh, and maybe some of my questions have been partially answered. But you didn't directly address NATO's nuclear po uh, posture, which uh, interests everybody in this room. Uh, and I wonder if you would uh, argue that if Canada were to leave NATO or if NATO were to cease to exist, more countries would sign on to the UN uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Would it make any difference there or not? Uh, and then the, the second question I have, and it's sort of been raised tangentially here, uh, but given uh, President Trump's notable uh, skepticism about the value of NATO, uh, do you think there is any value in keeping the United States within a transatlantic collective security alliance? Uh, 
Maybe it's not NATO, maybe it's something better or something else or, or some alliance with the uh, European Union common defense policy or whatever. But is there value in keeping the United States within uh, so that type of collective security alliance? Okay, on the first point, uh, nuclear posture, I, I, it's not actually an area I've, I've studied, so I, 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 I couldn't well, it's, it's really it's argue. But I mean, I would suspect that by being in NATO makes us less likely to um, condemn nuclear weapons than if we were outside NATO, I, I would suspect. Um, the second point would be sort of rewriting NATO's mission as keeping the Americans down. Okay? Yeah, um, and, you know, I can see the logic in that, and I think it's very similar to what was said here, okay, that, you know, NATO could serve a purpose in, in restraining the Americans. You know, and, and you could win me on that one if you could show me any evidence that this is actually <laughs> likely to be the case. Um, but I don't think, I don't think the, is. I, the Americans, if they want to do something, they do it at the moment because they're sufficiently militarily powerful that they can. And I have yet to see any evidence that um, NATO actually constrains them. Um, instead, I, I, I fear what happens is more a process of what um, psychologists would call group polarization, okay? whereby um, if you put people in a group, they tend um, not towards more moderate decisions, but towards uh, they polarize towards more extreme um, decisions. Okay, and, and I suspect that's more likely to happen than vice versa. Um. Should I should I ask a question or? At my peril, I, with, given the vigor and enthusiasm of your responses, I hate to disagree with you, but I'm going <laughs> to dare. Um, I'm not a particular fan of m militarization or NATO, but I think that if I were the Prime Minister of Canada, there would be absolutely no question in my mind about even raising the issue of leaving NATO, because NATO, our number one foreign policy interest as Canadians is getting along with the Americans. And NATO is our cost of doing business. The same reason we buy F-105 or F-35s or whatever. It's a small price to pay for having our access to the American market. I, I think, uh, I, don't, I don't like it, but I just think that is the Canadian reality. And we have really no, ch to debate about whether we should leave NATO, I think is not um, a very live option. I'd like to hear your response to that. So I, th I think I sort of tackled that some degree earlier in, in terms of influence. I mean, Mexico's not a member of NATO. They, they, they're in NAFTA the same as we are. Okay, um, America has interest too. I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna just shoot itself in the foot. We're, we're America's uh, number one training, actually we're, not, we're gonna be number two now after China. Okay, um, so we're, we're number, we've gone down, we're no longer number one, we're n number two, maybe number three, but you know, we're, we're still quite a lot of trade with us. Okay, there's no, you know, if we weren't in NATO, or preferably, I mean, I'm not actually saying, like, Canada unilaterally, I mean, I, my argument is more like, NATO as a whole shouldn't exist, in which case the whole question would be moot, okay? Um, but say we would unilaterally leave, you know, are they going to sanction us? No, I mean, you know, I mean, why, why would they? I mean, it's not like it would help them to do so. Um, so I'm kind of I, I I get what you're saying, uh, and um, you know if I was Canadian Prime Minister, I probably wouldn't be issuing marching orders <laughs> uh, without provocation. Okay, um, the invasion of Iraq might have been sufficient provocation, but like right now, there's nothing which 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 could provoke a walkout. Okay, um, but you know if the whole organization was to cease to exist, would Canada be worse off as a result of it? I I don't see, and I don't think America. You know, America, you, we would still have and probably want to have some connections with them. I mean, I'm not saying like NORAD might still continue to exist, for instance, okay? So, I mean, NORAD doesn't have, to, NORAD can be there without NATO. Okay. So, so we can still have defense cooperation with the Americans. We don't have to be in NATO to do that, okay? But then we can make sure that that defense cooperation was actually about defense of North America. And we could, re we could recalibrate our defense relationship to say, okay, 
we're not interested in defending Europe anymore. We're not interested in invading Libya. Okay, we are interested in defending North America, and we will we will cooperate fully with you on that. Okay, uh, and you know we may find willing partners. Your talk reminds me of, of some of the work that I did when I worked for the Auditor General. Uh, you know, you'd find institutions that were uh, engaged in promoting themselves and, and in growing, uh, independently of how well they were needed. Uh, now, maybe NATO fits into that, maybe not, I don't know. Another thing that we would do is we would say, let's follow the money. And you, I'd be very curious to know where the money is in here, because I found in my own work, if you could find where the money went to, what private institutions, as well as uh, bureaucratic pockets, uh, that would sometimes explain actions. Uh, you know, uh, many, many years ago, Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex. You know, I call it now today, I have an acronym for it called SIC, the security industrial complex. Uh, but I, I really would like to know where the, you know, this immense amount of money is going beyond the salaries of people in the military. So um, about 50% of the military budget is salaries. It's about 50%. Um, the other 50% will be on defense procurement and also on uh, property maintenance and, 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 st uh, and uh, actual operational expenses, uh, buying new ammunition, replacing st equipment which is broken down, uh, just, just new parts, just looking after your bases, housing for the troops and, and stuff like this, okay? Um, so... Um, you know, sa salaries are the, the number one expenditure, okay? But uh, in, if you talk about the United States, that still leaves uh, us, well, they spend, what, $600 billion a year on defense? Uh, it's going to go up to 700 or something. That's still half of that. It's still $300 billion being spent on stuff, okay? That does generate quite a lot of uh, what you might call military-industrial complex interests um, because clearly there is money to be made out of this. There are careers invested in it. Um, people have invested their whole lives in this. Something like missile defense, right, in Europe. And my own view on it, like, it doesn't make, to me, doesn't make any sense in geostrategic terms because the threat for which it's allegedly against nuclear-tipped Iranian ballistic missiles, it, it doesn't exist, and I don't think it is going to exist, but yet we're investing billions in it, and I think that's because it's just, it's just become a thing. You know, people have spent their entire life since Reagan's Star Wars working on this, okay? And there are now, like, departments and, uh, you know, whole offices and floors or whatever it may be in the, in, in the Pentagon devoted to this, uh, and vast sums of money being spent on it, and missile defense of America, too, against the North Koreans, right? Which we spent tens of billions of dollars on. Obviously, it doesn't work, or they wouldn't be so scared of the North Koreans, okay? Um... But, you know, it keeps on going because it just has its <coughs> momentum. But I don't have a very good answer to, to, to where the money goes. It goes all sorts of places. Okay, it's almost two o'clock. I'll entertain one more question if there is one. Yes, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Anita Kikay. I'm a high school student. Um, I'm a grade 12 student at Lisger Collegiate. Um, and my question for you is, is similar to what was asked over here, um, where it was more s based on uh, institutions, but what do you think a world without NATO would look like? And we know that we're veering away from a multipolar world. We're kind of inching in towards a unipolar world, and the fact that Canada keeps trying to make these efforts to have a seat at the big boy table, so to speak, is just proving that. But what exactly, in a realistic sense, do you think the world would look like without NATO? Um, that's a very good question, to which I don't have a desperately good answer. Um, I mean, it requires something of a, a crystal ball. I, I, I think that some people view the world as moving towards sort of regionalization, right? So, so we're going to have um, um, a bunch of regional blocks, like you know, the, the S Shanghai Cooperation Organization, NATO may be still existing, something in the, the far. E uh, uh, you know, or something in the Asia Pacific region and so on. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, 
you know, I think a world without NATO will be a world in which primarily Europe will be a different place because NATO is, is primarily it's a, it's a European North American institution. Okay, so, so if you're talking about replacing NATO, then you're talking about some new institution which would shape European security. Okay, and my view is that logically speaking, that should be something which integrates all of Europe. Okay, so we'd have to integrate not only the current NATO members, but also all, 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 all the countries in Europe which are not, not part of NATO, which that would mean Russia, it would mean, uh, you know, um, Sweden, Belarus, Serbia, so on, and, and you'd have some essentially non, non-military structure, okay? Because no one's going to be invading Europe, okay? Let's be quite honest, okay? Okay, yeah, so, so maybe something like OSC, but the OSC is a little, you know, the OSC beefed up a little bit, something like that, perhaps. Um, but I'm not, I don't have a desperately good answer to that, okay? Maybe if I'd be, been, had more time to think about it, but I was asked, like, do we need NATO to be, so, so I, I just stuck to that and, and I haven't thought beyond that, okay. stirred the pot here quite a bit, uh, Paul, but I think this was a very rich discussion and we could have gone on for a while. Um, maybe we can encourage people to get in touch with you personally if, if uh, they yeah, have yeah. follow-up questions. But in the meantime, um, thank you everyone for participating in the discussion and please join me in thanking Paul Robinson. <laughs>